Good evening and welcome to all of you. We are delighted to have all of you here. We're going to talk about the character we deliver tonight, the third of this little lecture in Jewish Catholic, Jewish Christian relations. And this is a very special event for all of us at the program for Jewish civilization. You can see our new banner that just won a design award. So we are celebrating many, many occasions, but this one in particular. I uh, would like to welcome all of the distinguished faculty, the clergy, the students, the friends of Fred and Leslie, and Fred and Leslie, of course, to thank them, as we will thank them more tonight for this very uh, joyous event for us at Georgetown, and in particular at the program for Jewish civilization. I, the evening will be as follows. I uh, will make some introductory remarks. I will then introduce uh, Father Brian McDermott, uh, who will introduce Fred Israel to you, who will introduce Colin McCarrick. And we will have Colin McCarrick speaking for about 30 minutes or so. And then we will take questions. And we are supposed to end this evening by around 10 past 8. Um, my colleague, Bob Lieber, who is the head of the uh, academic committee of the PJC, Rabbi White, Melissa Spence, our program director, the indispensable program director, all our distinguished members of the ex committee, friends, and colleagues. <laughs> Within the program of Jewish civilization in Georgetown, we endow the <coughs> annual lectureship on Jewish Catholic relations, which is concerned expressively with the dialogue between Judaism and the Ro and Roman Catholic. Christianity. It is with great sadness that we note the passing in 2004 of Al Israel, the son of Fred and Leslie Israel. In order that this name may be remembered and honored, our very good friends, Fred and Leslie, thought it is fitting that this lectureship now be entitled the Erman Al Ellen Al Israel. Endowed lectureship in Jewish Catholic relations at Georgetown is a very special lectureship, and we are fortunate to have had remarkable speakers, but very fortunate tonight to have His Eminence Cardinal McCarrick with us. Fred and Leslie Israel worked tirelessly to help build a world in which understanding flourishes. They have been very generous supporters of our projects for many years at Georgetown, the campus ministry, and the program for Jewish civilization. And we are very grateful for their dedication and commitment to our program, to Georgetown, and really to their friendship to me personally and to many of us here. The, continuing, the continuation of the dialogue between the communities of faith is a crucial for Georgetown in particular, but it's crucial for peace, and it is essential mission for Georgetown University, as you will see in the next few years, as Georgetown now is embarking on really understanding the relation between faith in the 21st century. With the passing of Pope John Paul II, we have lost one of the most important figures of our time, who labored to bridge the gaps so ingrained between peoples of various faiths. The Pope unprecedented steps toward rapprochement between Jews and the Church have helped to overcome generations of animosity, prejudice, and misunderstandings. He courageously undertook the 1993 Vatican recognition of Israel and its 2000 historic visit to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, and to the Western Wall were a crucial milestone in Jewish-Christian relations. At the time of the Pope visit, it was clear to all of us that this is really a new era in Jewish-Christian relations. The past
passing of the Pope, of course, received tremendous attention and grief throughout the world. And at the time, also the public in Israel, which is usually not so keen on this interface relations, were very much in mourning. Prime Minister Sharon announced that the world lost one of the most important leaders of our time, whose contribution to bringing people together, uniting nations, and to the understanding and tolerance will accompany us for many years. The work to bring Jews and Christians together is also the work in which the new pontiff has taken upon himself. Pope Benedict, who came to the pontiff last April, already assembled 25 major Jewish leaders last June where he announced that the history of relation between our two communities has been complex and often painful. But I'm convinced that the spiritual patrimony treasured by Christian and Jews is itself the source of the wisdom and inspiration capable of guiding us toward the future of hope in accordance with the divine plan. In this spirit, we are here fortunate again tonight to host His Eminence Cardinal McCarrick. <coughs> Before we introduce the Cardinal, allow me to introduce <coughs> Father Brian McDermott, who has been director of the Jesuit community at Georgetown University since 2000. From 1993 to 2005, he was a member of the board of director of the university, and at Georgetown is presently teaching a full course, The Problem of God, no less. And in the spring course, entitled Jesuit Studies, History, and Spirituality. Father McGurbert has been a member of the college class of 1958, and he entered the Maryland province of Society of Jesus in 1956. He was ordained as priest in 1968. He received his doctorate in systematic theology from the University of Nieringen and the Netherlands in 1973. And as a member of the faculty of the Western Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he served from 1973 to 2000. This biography is long, but he told me this is enough. <laughs> More than enough. So I'm delighted to have all of you here to host Cardinal McCarrick with us. And I invite now Brian McCormick to introduce Fred Israel and the Cardinal. Please. The just shall flourish like a palm tree, shall grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit even at a mature age, always vigorous and sturdy, as they proclaim, the Lord is just, our rock, in whom there is no wrong. The life of Theodore Cardinal McCarrick, Archbishop of the Catholic Archdiocese of Washington, bears witness to the words of the 92nd Psalm. Cardinal McCarrick really needs no introduction to his many friends at Georgetown, yet it is my privilege to tell you a little bit about his work for justice in many areas, including religious freedom and human rights, and his encouragement of interreligious dialogue. Cardinal McCarrick is past chair of the Domestic and International Policy Committees for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. He is on the Board of Directors of Catholic Relief Services and member of the Vatican's Pontifical Councils for Promoting Church Unity, Justice, and Peace and Pastoral Care of Migrants and Itinerant Peoples and has served on the United States Commission for International Religious Freedom. 
He has traveled the world speaking out in support of the cause of justice for all people. And for his efforts, in 2000, he was honored by President Clinton with the Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights. A great friend of the Jewish community, Cardinal McCarrick has spoken at the Anti-Defamation League's observance of Holocaust Remembrance Day and to the Union of American Hebrew Congregations on the 40th anniversary of the Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism. He was a member of the National Interreligious Delegation in, to Washington in support of the Roadmap to Peace in the Middle East. For his role in promoting tolerance and human rights, in bettering relations between Catholics and Jews, and in speaking out against anti-Semitism, Cardinal McCarrick was awarded the Breslau Goldman Award, the highest honor of the Jewish community of Greater Washington in November 2003. For all these reasons and many more, Cardinal McCarrick is the most fitting choice to inaugurate the Herman Allen Hal Israel Endowed Lectureship in Jewish Catholic Relations. And now it is my privilege to invite to the podium Mr. Fred Israel. Restating an old Turkish proverb, we are the masters of the words we do not utter and the slaves of those we do. We communicate our ideas in words, changing an old idea to one which reverses centuries of utterance takes a great strength, for it requires the will to break the chains of bondage that the old words forge. Forty years ago, Vatican II broke the chain with the words Nostra Etate in our time. Pope John XXIII had urged the reconsideration of the Church's relations with the Jews. The Council did reconsider, and in 1965, upon the promulgation of the Council, the next Pope published Nostra Etate. Pope John Paul led the second, was the second Pope John Paul II, during his pontificate, by his words and deeds, led the church in creating a dialogue between Christians and Jews. We are, in our time, the inheritors of the mutual respect forged in the last 40 years, and, and we are tasked by John Paul's example to continue together his and the Jews' work in creating an even more enhanced environment of each community doing God's work as God has given each the light to see and understand our respective covenants. I was born 78 years ago in New York City. In that day, my family could not have imagined for me that in my time, I would have the honor and the pleasure of introducing a prince of the church at a lecture in the memory of my son, a Jew. Your Eminence, thank you for your efforts in bringing us both together, you and I, to this day of this place in our time. My friends, I have the high honor and distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker at the Howell Israel Memorial Lecture Series at this great Catholic and Jesuit university from which I and my two sons were awarded academic degrees. Reverend clergy, ladies and gentlemen, I give you His Eminence, Theodore Cardinal. I had a, a short conversation with Fred at the reception. And I went away saying, this man is a great master of the vocabulary, a great wordsmith. And certainly, you proved that again, so I'm, I'm delighted and, and grateful. It was my privilege and honor to be here last year at Georgetown when we, we celebrated the uh, Herman Allen Hal Israel Lectureship in the Catholic Jewish Relations. I was so pleased then that an old friend of mine, Rabbi David Rosen, had been chosen to give that lecture. 
and so it is with some trepidation and a lot of humility that I presume to give this one in this very important series. I do want to reach out for a moment to our Israel's mom and dad. Fred and Leslie Israel have been leaders in our community for so long. They are truly outstanding members of society in Washington, and the Jewish community itself must be so very proud of you. I know that Georgetown University is, and because this university is part of my family, I thank them for their generosity and for their wise and thoughtful support. I had written a wonderful series of words to Dr. DeJoya, who was supposed to introduce me tonight, but I'm happy to say that I can make up uh, out of my heart uh, words about Father Brian. Uh, Father Brian McDermott is not only a dear friend, but is my theologian. And the fact that I have not been arrested for heresy in the last five years is because Father Brian keeps me out of it. And so I'm very grateful to you, Father Brian. I'm grateful also to uh, Josie Stein, the director of the program for, uh, for Jewish Civilization here in the Everyday Law School of Foreign Service. The recent celebration of the 40th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, which, which Fred's mentioned, this monumental document of the Second Vatican Council points to the importance of such a program here at Georgetown. It could not have a better leader than Yossi, and I know that it will produce, continue to produce great results in fostering the understanding that the work of Nostra Aetate strove to achieve throughout the world. I'm truly delighted to give this Tao Israel lecture and to talk about the growth and development of the Catholic Jewish dialogue following the issuance of that landmark document, Nostra Aetate, 40 years ago. I want to start with a story, and uh, oh, about two months ago, I was privileged to speak at the, uh, I guess, the celebration of 350 years of Jewish presence in the United States. And I told this story then, and I, I, I love this story, and I want to tell it again. And if you've heard it before, you can doze for a little while, and I'll call you to your attention to back when we finish it. The story about my mother and my mother's family. They lived on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. And it was this funny area. It was just fascinating. It was America in, in, its, in its, really, in its, in its essence. Uh, the neighborhood seemed to be half Jewish and half Irish. And uh, the, the Jewish people were very fervent, mostly Orthodox. And they were very careful about Friday night. And my mother, now, you, none of you are old enough to remember what a, uh, a, uh, a Shabbos Goy was. A Shabbos Goy was the, the, the non-Jewish person who would open the door, put on the lights, uh, turn on the oven, whatever had to be done, because they would not touch any mechanical operation. And the wonderful part of it was that uh, those who became the Shabbos Goy got a, got a penny. A penny was not a bad tip in those days. And so for an Irish family of eight children, uh, whose father, my grandfather, was a wonderful man, but he was often out of work, <clears throat> partly because of his own this decision not to work that day. <laughs> Which the Irish are able to accomplish from time to time. <laughs> But my poor grandmother had to do all these things. And so when the youngsters came back on a, on a Friday night, maybe with eight pennies or more, if they had been fast enough to be able to be at two families at the same time, it was a help. And so I, I've always remembered those story, wonderful stories that my mother would tell me about the times when she was a shadow sky. But what I do remember more than anything else was one day, she sat me down, I was a youngster, and started telling me about the time when she was my age and do that. And she was so filled with enthusiasm for the, the pers perseverance and the fidelity of, that, of those families that they, they knew how important it was not to lose their Jewishness. They knew how important it was to stay within the, the family, within the ambit, within, within that great Jewish faith. And uh, 
My mother would, would say to me, these were great people. They were so faithful. And you could always trust their word. And you, you got to love them because they were just so good. And I think that's where my love affair with, with uh, all my Jewish brothers and sisters began. Because my mother had in mind this great, wonderful thought of how good they were. One last story. Uh, years ago, there was a, a wonderful article in, in the magazine, and I wish I had saved it. I, I probably did and lost what I had saved because I do that most of the time. When you get old, you're allowed to do that. But the, the title of it was Not Just Chicken Soup. And it was a story of, of Jewish families in New York. It was a story in which it, it, the this, the rabbi who wrote the article, and who was a sociologist too, had done some studies about Jewish families and had found that Jewish girls had certainly lower pregnancy rates as teenagers than as anybody else did. That, that Jewish boys had lower rates of, of teenage delinquency than almost anybody else did. And he went to opine why this was. And he felt it was the strength of the Jewish family and the, the, the love and the tradition which kept them strong and kept them always focused on what good people should be. I love the title of the audience, it's not just chicken soup. It was more than chicken soup. It was the, it was the love that they got at home and the strength they got from, from the teaching and, and the desire of their parents to make sure that they were always part of their lives. I think those are great lessons, and I, I, I bring them to you at the very beginning, because then you'll understand how I feel as I come to talk about these important factors. I've given this talk the title, Abraham, My Father in Faith, for a special reason. I say to our Jewish brothers and sisters, this is how we refer to them in the Catholic Mass. The first Eucharistic prayer is the most solemn of our liturgies, and at a particularly important place in the Mass, we speak of Abraham, our father in faith. We remember the patriarch with those words. I use them at Mass this morning, and whenever I do, I think of you and all my friends in the Jewish faith. The story of Abraham in the Old Testament is one of the most beautiful as far as I'm concerned. Abraham plays so great a role in the story of, our, of God's chosen people. He is the father, truly the father of Israel, the father of all the nations that have put their faith in the one true God. In the New Testament itself, there are 80 mentions of Abraham, a sign of the great importance that Catholics and Christians generally ascribe to him for his remarkable leadership role in the development of the Jewish faith, and indeed the Judeo-Christian tradition which has had so major an influence in the history of the world. Abraham has always been one of my favorites in the study of the Old Testament. When as children, we were given lessons in Bible history and learned all about the great leaders and characters of the wonderful story of the Promised Land. For me, Abraham was truly one of my heroes. I admired his leadership, his willingness to do God's will no matter how difficult it would seem to me. The fact that he talked to God face to face as a friend the wonderful human story of his hoping for a child and ultimately the visit of the angels which initiated the mysterious and joyful pregnancy of Sarah and the birth of Isaac, who was so well formed by his father that he was able to carry out so courageously his father's work. We see Abraham as the father of many nations and indeed the father of monotheism Without Abraham, we have, would have had a much different world. And the children of Abraham, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, people at least one-third of all the inhabitants of the earth. It is for that reason that Abraham plays such an important role in the history of the Catholic Church, since it is from the seed of Abraham that Mary gave birth to Jesus, a Jewish child, whom we Christians hail as the Messiah. In the decree Nostra Aetate, about which I would now like to speak, Abraham's role is significant, and the recognition of his importance in all the three great monotheistic faiths is underlined. 
I thought today it would be fitting for me to talk about Nostra Aetate in this lecture. It is certainly a landmark document and has affected Jewish-Christian relations, especially from the Catholic side, so extraordinarily during the past 40 years. Since it has been quoted so many times in the press, both secular and religious, over the past few months, it seems only fitting to use this in a special way as a major topic of this talk. From the very beginning of the Second Vatican Council, the great Pope John XXIII, who pulled the council, wanted it to make a statement on the Jews. He asked Cardinal Bea, the Italian Jesuit, who was such a great friend of the Jewish community and was so conscious of the importance of Catholic-Jewish relations to handle this question. It is indeed one of the dramatic stories of the council. Originally, as the Jesuit historian, Father Robert Graham writes, in his short but vital history of the document, the declaration was to be a chapter within the decree on ecumenism. During the second session of the council, the moderators, bishops, cardinals who had been named to guide the course of the council by the Holy Father, the moderators decided to leave the theme of Jewish-Christian relations for later on in the discussion of the council. However, this put the treatment on other than Christian religions, including the Jewish considerations, very much in doubt. It was then that Pope John XXIII stepped in. It became evident that Pope John himself had ordered preparation of this text, and so ultimately everyone fell into line. There were some at the council who advocated that it should be the subject of a separate document, since it did not have anything to do with ecumenism as such. There were others who did not want the council to say anything about the Jews, for fear that a statement would be considered by some Middle Eastern governments as a political move, favoring recognition of the state of Israel, and that Christian minorities in these countries would therefore be made to suffer in reprisal. During the period between the second and third sessions of the council, the Secretariat, headed by Carla Bayer, worked on a new draft on the Jews and other non-Christians. According to Father Graham, who was an expert, or in the formal Latin terminology, a paritas during the Second Vatican Council, and very much involved in informal discussions, it was between the second and third sessions of the Council that Carla Bayer and his staff prepared a new draft on Jews and other non-Christians. This text was of great importance, and it finally put an end to the statements held by some Christians over the centuries that the people of Israel were to be blamed for the death of Jesus. This document was of such great importance as it came from the hands of Cartabea and his staff. But when that document appeared, there were some who were troubled by it, who did not want it to see the light. So the drama of the document was not over. When the Council Fathers returned to Rome after the summer recess, because it was the, the, the tradition that they would, they would stay in Rome for four months and then go home to take care of their, their work at home, there were the dioceses and the churches that they presided over. But when they returned to Rome after the summer recess, there was a new text in which special attention was given to Muslims and the attention to the Jewish people was toned down. One of the French cardinals, Cardinal Leonard, the Archbishop of Lille, insisted that the deleted paragraphs on the Jews be put back. He was followed by a long line of cardinals from all around the world who made the same request. Several of these cardinals were from the United States, we're proud to say. Cardinal Cushing of Boston, Cardinal Meyer of Chicago, Cardinal Ritter of St. Louis, Cardinal Frings of Germany, also very strong in insisting on a change. Ultimately, the text we have today was presented, discussed, and overwhelmingly approved by the Council Fathers. By this time, Pope John had died, but his successor, Pope Paul VI, had always been a strong supporter of the document as a cardinal, and he gave his own complete endorsement. It was he who signed it into, into the law of the church. It was soon to become one of the most important documents of that historic gathering. 
I want to quote just a few of the statements of Nostra Aetate, just to give you some idea of the great value of the document, especially in its historic context, remembering that this document was written 40 years ago. It presents some fundamental positions, which, thank God, are now more or less <coughs> taken for granted, but at that time were of groundbreaking importance. Here's one. The Church cannot forget that she has received the revelation of the Old Testament through the people who God, in his inexpressible mercy, deigned to establish the ancient covenant. Nor can she forget that she, the Church, draws sustenance from the root of that great olive tree into which have been grafted the wild olive branches of the Gentiles. When I, I think of that, whoever wrote that, I think Fred might have written that. <laughs> it's, it, it has, it has that, that, kind of, that, 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 that kind of beauty to it. And, it. and it says so very much. The church cannot forget that she draws sustenance from the root of that good olive tree into which she had been grafted the wild olive branches of the Gentile. Nostra Aetate faces anti-Semitism squarely and says the following. The Church repudiates all persecutions against any man. Moreover, mindful of her common patrimony with the Jews, and motivated by the Gospel's spiritual love and by no political considerations, she deplores the hatred, persecutions, and displays of anti-Semitism directed against Jews at any time and from any source. End of quote. It is significant that in order to make the point totally clear once again, Pope Benedict XVI, our present Holy Father, quoted these important statements in his moving visit to the synagogue in Cologne last August. It was his first journey outside Italy since his election as Supreme Head of the Church. The fact that a German Pope visited a German synagogue and one whose present sight had been destroyed in the Kristallnacht made his words all the more important for us all. Someone told me a story the other day, and I, I can't verify it, but that the, the rabbi of the synagogue that he, that he where Holy Father visited was the son of a woman who was killed during the, the harvest of the Christophe. At that emotional moment, the Holy Father said, in the 40 years that have passed since the Conciliar Declaration of Stratate, much progress has been made in Germany and throughout the world toward better and closer relations between Jews and Christians. But much still remains to be done. We must come to know one another much more and much better. Consequently, I would encourage sincere and trustful dialogue between Christians and Jews, for only in this way would it be possible to arrive at a shared interpretation of disputed historical questions and above all, to make progress toward a theological evaluation of a relationship between Judaism and Christianity. This dialogue, if it is to be sincere, must not gloss over on domestic or underestimate the existing differences in these areas in which, due to our profound convictions and faith, we may diverge, and indeed, in, price, in precisely those areas, we need to show respect for one another. But continually, in Holy Father's words, finally, our gaze should not only be directed to the past, but should look forward to the tasks that await us today and tomorrow. Our rich common heritage and our fraternal and more trusting relations now call upon us to join together in giving an ever more harmonious witness and to work together on the practical level for the defense and promotion of human rights, the sacredness of human life, for family values, for social justice, and for peace in the world. And when you grow up in New York and you get to know Jewish families, you know the family values are so strong. We can learn so much from them. And we pray that they will always be strong and that Jewish families will always stay together. In fact, 
as part of the official celebration of the 40th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, which I was privileged to attend in Rome two weeks ago, and my friend Rabbi David Rosen, together with Cardinal Lustige, the former Archbishop of Paris, were the two uh, prominent speakers at that occasion. I had seen the front row. Pope Benedict XVI sent an eloquent letter to Cardinal Walter Kasper, another German cardinal, the president of the Commission for Jewish for Religious Relations with the Jews. In that letter, the Holy Father speaks as follows. This anniversary gives us abundant reason to express gratitude to Almighty God for the witness of all those who, despite a complex and often painful history, and especially after the tragic experience of the Shoah, which was inspired by an ego pagan racist ideology. All these people who worked courageously to foster reconciliation and improved understanding between Christians and Jews. It gave us a chance to witness to them, to thank them over the years for persevering in this new relationship and in building the bridges that we must build always. Again, may I cite the letter of the Holy Father that he wrote to Cardinal Castro at that celebration. Pope Benedict writes, As we look to the future, I express my hope that both in theological dialogue and in everyday contacts and collaboration, Christians and Jews will offer an ever more compelling shared witness to the one God, to his, and to his commandments, to the sanctity of life, the promotion of human dignity, the rights of the family, and the need to build a world of justice, reconciliation, and peace for future generations. End of the quote. It was then, dear friend, surely no surprise, but a graceful moment when all the Catholic bishops of the world gathered in Rome for this ecumenical council. At that historic place and time, could say, and I quote, Nostritati again, as this sacred synod searches into the mystery of our own church, it remembers the bonds that spiritually tie the people of the new covenant to the great stock of Abraham. And that is why Nostra Aetate is so important for us today. From all this, all that we said, it is vital to realize that Nostra Aetate is not just a beautiful document, which can be quoted by Christians and Jews alike. It is not just stayed on the shelf as a silent monument. A short time after its publication, it gave rise to the Vatican's Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews. And this commission has been very active over the years. One of the facets of it, which I would like to talk about, is that beginning two, two, two and a half years ago, the commission has had regular meetings with the chief rabbinate of Israel. Common declarations on four different occasions were reached after these meetings. One of them was on the sanctity of human life. Another on the relevance of central teachings in the Holy Scriptures. A third on a shared vision of social justice and ethical conduct that we find in the Scriptures. And the last, just a few months ago, on the relationship between religious and civil authority in the Jewish and Christian tradition. So you see they are, they are handling theological and practical and cultural and social relationships, uh, all of which is fascinating to me. These meetings have had such great importance for common understanding and cooperation. They are an enormously important step forward in our continually growing understanding of one another. The Commission also spoke about the sanctity of human life in words that touch very grave concerns for all of us, including the horrors of suicide bombing. I quote from that document. To protect human life is an evident ethical consequence of this conviction of ours. Every believer, particularly religious leaders, must cooperate in protecting human life. Any attack against the life of a human being runs contrary to the will of God and is a desecration of God's name, directly opposed to the teaching of the prophets. Taking any human life, including one's own, 
even in the name of God, is sacrilegious, as was emphasized time and time again by Pope John the, Don Paul II in his message for the World Day of Peace in the year 2002, and I quote the Holy Father here, no religious leader can condone terrorism anywhere in the world. It is a profanation of religion to declare oneself a terrorist in the name of God, to do violence to others in his name. Terrorist violence anywhere in the world is a contradiction of faith in God, the greater of man who cares for man and loves him. This is the end of the quotation from the document <coughs> released by the, uh, the Vatican Commission and the Rabbinate. In February 2003, the delegation from the Vatican Commission and the Chief Rabbinate of Israel considered the difficult situation in the Holy Land. Their statement manifested their shared dismay and sorrow at the continuing violence, but also the presence of hope, which has always been such a constant blessing in the culture of the Judeo-Christian world. As religious leaders, they said, we share in the pain and sorrow of all who have suffered in the Holy Land today, individuals, families, and communities, and we express our fervent hope and prayers for an end to the trials and tribulation in that land which is holy to us all. Finally, the statement goes on, we urge our own communities, our schools, and our families to live in mutual respect and understanding and to immerse themselves in the study and teaching of our Holy Scriptures the scriptures which we share, for the ennoblement of humanity, for universal peace and justice. Thus will the words of the prophet be fulfilled, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up the sword against nation, and they shall not learn war anymore. Together, dear friends, our two peoples must work for the end of violence all over the world. As we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we recognize that this is certainly very clear in the will of God. We pray that the days will come when Israeli mothers and fathers will be able to see their children go to the store or to a party without fear that they may never return alive. We also pray that the Palestinian people may build a nation of their own with secure borders and with peace and justice for all. For all these things, we must work together. Nostratati has cleared away some of the terrible pain that we Christians have caused our Jewish brothers and sisters over the centuries. Now we must continue to work together to build a better world, a world in which all men and women may worship God and find in his presence the key to peace and happiness and fulfillment. I have another story I want to tell you. It's a story that took place in Shanghai about five years ago, or maybe more. I was there with uh, Rabbi Arthur Schneier, who many of you may know. We were on a visit to do a number of things to ask the Chinese government to be more favorable to, to visit. But the rabbi had known that in Shanghai, which had been a great place of refuge for Jewish people uh, in, right in, in the Hitler times, people would, would flee. Suddenly, sometimes they couldn't get out through the West, so they get out through through the Middle East and through Russia, and they would they would go there, and then by by all kinds of devious ways they they would get into China, and in Shanghai there was a flourishing Jewish community in the 1930s. The the Bund has many stores that were established by by German and Austrian Jews, where it flourished, and they made a difference. In in the life of Shanghai in those days. Well, there was a synagogue there, probably more than one. But as time went by, as Shanghai was invaded by the Japanese, and as the communists and the whole world of, of China changed so much, only one synagogue remained that were recognizable, that people could, could see was, was still where it was. It had been made a storehouse for books, and the place where the, the scriptures were held was still present, but dirty, and with, a, with a curtain in front of it that had seen better days and books all around. 
There was a young Jewish man whose father taught at Seton Hall University, and so he, he knew me slightly through his father, as I was Archbishop of Newark in those days. And he went with us, and he said, I think I can find where the, where the, the tabernacle was, where, the, where the, the place where they kept the, 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 the sacred scrolls were. And the guards who were with us who led us into the building, uh, because we were official guests of the, uh, of the government that allowed us to, to push books aside and to move bookcases. And finally, over in the corner, we, we, we saw the steps going up to this holy place. We found it. The scriptures were no longer there. They had been long removed. But the place was there. And this young man, and I'm always impressed by these things, this young man, he was cold as winter, he had a scarf on. And he put a scarf over his head. And he said, I shouldn't be bareheaded here. This is a holy place. I went back to my mother's stories. And I saw there again that the great secret of, of, of the continuing place of Israel in the world, where in every century, there have been great people from the Jewish faith. In every century. And today's century, last century, this still is always that present in our lives. And I think it is because, as we teach, the Holy Father, the Holy One God, our Lord in heaven, made his covenant with the people of Israel. He's never changed his mind. And that is why there is a certain special gift that they have. Because he's with them. And always will be. The declaration of February 2003, which was issued by the Vatican Commission on Religious Relations with the Jews, in connection with the chief rabbinate, ended with a beautiful quotation from Genesis. The, the quotation they chose was, For I have chosen him, Abraham, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord in doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. I could not do better than close this talk with that same quotation and with the prayer that all the children of Abraham will soon be able to live together in peace and justice and with mutual respect and love. Thank you very much. still have a few minutes left. Uh, I'm Robert Lieber, chair of the um, executive committee of the uh, Program of Jewish Civilization. Um, let me ask then if anyone would like to rise and ask uh, a question before the cardinal. Yes, over here.
uh, Christianity in Jewish terms, it's some published publications on the internet, and it's something that I looked at, but um, in terms of finding more resources and uh, where the groups that actually deal specifically with that kind of pastoral, family values issues, social and cultural that you alluded to, but do it specifically for that on the ground uh, where faith and faith From what you tell me, you probably know much more about us than I do. <laughs> no, I, I would say there are there are certainly areas where uh, this could be discussed, and, and where you could find uh, in among the theologians of, uh, of the Catholic Church and the theologians of the, among the rabbis uh, conversations on this. Uh, I, I think it would be it would be valuable to you to to, to pursue that uh, and to uh, to find perhaps at. Uh, uh, at, at the bishops' conference, where there is a, a, uh, a an agency a, which talks about, I guess, on, on our level, sort of like the Vatican Commission on relations with the Jews, and 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 chat with them, and, and with your wife, and, and to make sure that you are one uh, in, uh, in 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 yeah. and you have children now, or you're just getting ready. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to ask. <laughs> Anyway, that would be my answer too. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, yes, you're in the second row. You used a phrase from the document, I believe, twice at least, religious relations with the Jews. Seems larger than just dialogue and perhaps smaller than spiritual relations. I wonder if you could expand on that first. I think that, uh, I thank you for the question. Did you do hear, the, we, the, the Vatican has called this commission the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews. I, I think they probably wanted to make sure it wasn't political relations, because that's, that's handled in another area. I think that's basically the reason that they did it. And so the religious is like, Alice in Wonderland would say a portmanteau uh, word. You could put anything in it you want. But it distinguishes it from political relations or diplomatic relations, something like that. May I encourage larger fantasies? <laughs> All fantasies never die. That's what, that's what Fred said. He's probably right. <laughs> He certainly couldn't have had Isaac without him. <laughs> we have time for one or two more questions. I'm not sure if we can top that one. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, yes, Leslie, last point. But we are, in fact, an Abrahamic triumvirate. And much of the stresses and strains in today's world deal with the three-way rather than the two-way economy. How do we resolve this? Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right, of course. We should never stop having Jewish-Catholic relations. We should never stop that, because I think they are growing. And they have their own pace, and they have their own life, and they have their own their, their own ability to, to become very, very valuable for us and helpful and grace-filled for us. But I, I think you're absolutely right. We are having, a, we have Todd Lomstein is here, who runs the, our, our Metropolitan Interfaith uh, groups uh, here in Washington. And he not only has, he has like a, a, a 14th fold uh, group where everybody gets together. But I, I think there is a, a very clear role for, for Abrahamic, uh, the Abrahamic family to get together. Uh, I was privileged to go to, uh, uh, to go to Iran two years ago as part of an Abrahamic delegation where we had Muslim, Christian, and, uh, and, and Jewish groups together. And that was very, very helpful uh, because we, 
we it, it expanded all our visions. The, 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 the Jewish representatives had their vision expanded. I certainly had mine expanded. I think our Muslim brothers had theirs expanded too. I think in today's world, uh, it is it is so important on many levels. It's important on the political level in a very special way, and and because I think sometimes on the political level you will not be able to make as much progress until you are on the human level and on the spiritual level. I think those uh, those kind of, of of dialogues, those kind of discussions, are very important. Uh, I'm presently involved, and we have one. Uh, with regard to, to the Holy Land, where we have a number of Jewish rabbis, some of the most prominent ones in the country, and a number of, uh, of Protestant and Catholic bishops, and a number of Muslim imams and leaders, where we're talking on, basically we're talking on the, uh, on the diplomatic level, but there's more to it. As you, get, as you get closer together, you get closer to God. And that's a wonderful way to be.